So the earth level, think of it as uh, the souls come back to this earth for different reasons. It's all learning, but this place gives wonderful opportunities, rich opportunities to grow and to learn that other galaxies, other schools and universes wouldn't. So this is a place that baby souls can come back and baby souls can experience war and power and money and then think that that's the all and that's the end all, that's everything. And there are, you know, the postgraduate souls that come here to bring healing and understanding and passionate and love. And then you also have the middle souls who are still, you know, in between the baby and the postgraduate is still learning. And because you have all the diversity there, the, you know, the baby souls, the postgraduate souls, the middle souls, it forces them, all of us then, to have these scenarios, these experiences, to act out. And through those scenes that we act out, we can go within ourselves, see, how would I handle that? What are the choices I do here? How is that person influencing me? If they don't know themselves, it's gonna be harder to make the right choice. We always start off every podcast in the energy of excitement. So what are you most excited about right now in your life? I'm really excited about my school, my, my school online, the JVP School of Mystical Arts, because it keeps growing. And I did, um, right now, I had this this week with Cyber, it's Monday here, and I, I took two courses that I started my school with. One was um, the Psychic Certification course, and the other was Mediumship Certification 1. And there's the two very first courses I started this school, and it brought me back to when I, t when I videotaped those and wrote my, all the material. And I love sharing. I love sharing the knowledge, the wisdom that I've received and I've gleaned and they've given me to people. And so that's the exciting thing. And I'm giving you 50% off. That's, I thought, well, because some people can't say they can't afford certain things. Well, that's not expensive, but that's fine. So it gives my, me joy to reach people from all over the world, which is those two courses, because it's a way to get people on their journey. It's, it's a attempt to open them up. And it really is, um, once you get into, as you know, the, the intuitive self or what, and you start studying the, the uh, I'm going to say the cosmic arts. Oh, how do you like that word? The cosmic arts. Mm -hmm. Never heard that before. It, it, it gives that soul, you know, we are souls having human experience. And it really starts activating that sense, that, um, that uh, perspective, that you're a soul who feels who knows things, who've been here many, many times. We're not the human, we're that soul. So these courses open up that soul self. It, it, it brings back the relationship of soul that we go through um, when we first are born into the physical. We go through what's called the valley of forgetfulness. And it's kind of like a, the, the uh, chalkboard is wiped clean because we have to start new in a way. But it brings people back to that sense of their soul that I've been here eons and eons of times. And not only have been in this earth space, this physical space, but other other planets, other galaxies, if you will. But it's the very beginning of bringing them that power back of intuitive self, the sixth sense, because we're all the sixth senses, not five. So it's opening. And once people, as you know, once people get back to that sense of, oh, I got this, oh, I know this, I knew this, I had this knowingness, and it's validated, that opens up back to their soul. So that's pretty incredible. So those courses, I'm a teacher, you know, I love to teach. I love to, I talked about this last night in my podcast. I, I One of the joys I get, MDO, is I love to see that light bulb uh, or light uh, go off above a person's head when they acknowledge, oh yeah, when they make that connection. Oh wow, you know, and they get it. And, and the mediumship oh. part of it is like, when I talk to dead people, I say, that's, that's a part of it. That's, that comes with the territory. But really it's about learning who you are as a soul and living your life from that perspective of my soul and I, and seeing everybody else as souls, just having the human experience and pulling people out of that humanness because we're so caught up in the judgment and the fear with many humans are based on fear because we're programmed that way, of course, from seven, eight years of age, we're programmed that. So, these courses help people to go back to their beginnings. And I, and I often say about when we, you know, when we first come into this earth, that joyfulness, that, that innocence that we have as little kids playing. And that's what we talked about earlier about sense of humor. You have to have that mm -hmm. joyfulness as a little kid. Because when you have that opening, that innocence, that imagination, you start learning and you, your mind is open. It's not closed down. It's not limited. So that's a real part of the work is joyfulness and, and happiness. And when you go into this, 
work as far as getting to know yourself, that joyfulness, you go back to that childhood. I have them go back on the course, go back to their childhood and see what happened to their, I say, you know, see yourself in an age when you were three or four or five and just bring yourself and your mind back to a space there. And then I just walk them through and say, now bring yourself to a space when you're like 18 or 19 years old. And they do say, okay, become aware of how you feel from the inside out, what's going on in your, around you, in the world around you. And then I said, now I bring, bring you to present day. And that could be someone in their 30s or 40s. And I say, look around you. <clears throat> what has changed in your life? Where was the joy that you had as a little baby, as a little boy, a little girl? What happened to that imagination, that joy? Where did it go? And I have them go back and they assess their lives and they see where they gave their power away, right? And they see mm. that they got caught up in that trap where it's like, oh, you know, you got this, even as children's school, you got to do this to get an A. And mommy and daddy, you got to do this to get our love. And, and that's, they translate that as, wow, if I do the right thing, I'll get mommy's love or daddy's love. And we all do it. And again, if we don't have a sense of ourselves, we're just following. We're just always trying to get someone's love. And that validates us, right? So soon enough, we become people pleasers. People pleasers. And we do... Been there. Been right? there for sure. We all, <laughs> right? And then we become we become doormats. And and doormats... Mm. Um, not good. I'll turn my phone down here. Um, doormats because we let people wipe their shoes on us, you know, and, and take our power away. We give our power to others because we want them to love us, forgetting all about us and our worthiness. So I think you know, in life, we need these moments, right? These times to stop, take a moment to breathe and look around and see where we've come from. And these courses I have, um, I, I've created them with that design, that, 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 that was a theme, but that was my goal. And I've made it. I, I, people have lives have changed with the school courses. And it's really, I, I love that. And um, people from all over the world. And uh, I just love teaching. I love, like I said, seeing that light bulb go off and, and that light. And the most important thing, and then I'll shut up, the most important thing <laughs> is that when they get into that space of knowledge and awareness and their own soul's wisdom, and they evolve and they expand with that wisdom, they have to remember to keep it real, right? They got to keep mm -hmm. it real. They got to keep their feet firmly on the ground. Because um, if you have your head in the stars all the time, you're no earthly good. And we're here to work on this earth. We're here to be human, ex the experience of a human. So we can't forget that. So we got to be human too, but have that wisdom, that awareness, and our power, living in our power self, not the ego, ego, E-G-O, and that's edging God out, right? And we have to be that beautiful, bringing that God in and living that God light, that, that God spark, and bringing that God to surface, which is unconditional love, beauty, and trying to use that to bring, see God in every person, see that light in everyone. And, and I often say that uh, every day on our path, there's a student or a teacher every single day. And we have to be open enough to receive from the teacher and learn. And if not, does it resonate with us? Fine, we don't need it. But also be recognized when there's a student and you need to bring what you've learned, the wisdom you've learned to others. So that's what my, that's my thing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I feel like right now we are electrifying Earth right now because there's so many of those light bulbs going off right now. And you mentioned the light bulb being that moment when you open up to the greater awareness of who you really are, the multidimensionality. It was so funny. I think it was probably because of the energy that was coming from the interview that was going to happen today. I was leaving the gym. It was such a funny story. Uh, I had a friend that he invited me to dinner and I told him, um, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll see if I can make it. And then I forgot to get back to him. A week goes by. I'm this, this is today now. Now I'm leaving the gym and he pops in my mind like, bro, you never got back to me. And like, it just popped into my mind and I go to reach my phone to answer him like, Hey, I'm so sorry. Like, can you still make it that day? He had texted me three minutes before. Oh, wow. <laughs> saying wow. hey bro like i just wanted to check in with you like is, does this still work with you we might have to reschedule so i was like there's no way that that was a light bulb moment we are opening up to these abilities we're developing the consciousness is shifting in the world right now so it, it's that, it, i wanted to bring you really what you say it's that it's that awareness and we all have it and the more we can trust you know we're really if i can just say this to you so we can move on we can look at this um, as mm. a soul, I often say that as a soul, 70% of your soul is outside the body, 
right? And it's doing different things. It's activating different places and spaces and, and knowingnesses and telepathically you're connected with a lot of things. And only 30% is in this human form. So let's spend time here, which is about telepathy, awareness, knowledge, power. And with those people close to you, like friends and associates that you really connect with, there's that connection. And um, when we can acknowledge that, and we can, you know, in the spirit world, they don't speak with voices. They don't have that. It's all telepathy. It's all, and I think mm -hmm. that you're, as you're saying, you know, what you say, I believe that that awareness is going to come down to this level and we're going to start. This is about your example with your friend. More and more that ha is going to happen. I, I really do believe that. Maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly in yours, I believe. Uh, and it's happening it, fast. Like, I, happening. I wanted to bring you back to when you were my age, 25. 25? Uh, you might remember I, this. <laughs> yeah. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> a friend dragged you uh, to a British medium, yes. Brian Hurst. Yeah. And he's like, hey, I want you to meet this medium. You didn't even have, you didn't even know what, what mediumship medium was. was at that yeah. point. And he tells you the spirits are planning to use you right. to change the consciousness on the planet. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you what what is changing exactly in the consciousness? And in 40 years of doing this, then you later developed yourself. Yeah. You're mastering in this ability. What have you seen change not only in your reality, but outside too? Wow, it's a big, big question. It's a big question. Um, I'm writing a book right now, and there's different sections of that, so I have to break it down to sections. Um, I'm writing a book right now, and my next book is going to be called um, My Life Has Gone to the Dogs, because um, things have changed so much from I call the old world to the new world, and it's just a matter of, in my time, um, things are very different. In my time, there was no social media. In my time, there were pay phones. In my time, you knew your neighbors. In my time, it was, you know, you had community um, in a different form, if you will. I, I don't know. I, I think that the younger generation, yourself included, no wonder there are many of star beings here because we need light. I think in, in some ways, social media can be a positive or a negative. And, I, and we've both seen that. And this is a positive way it's being used and to help people and to serve people. In it. But in negative too, I think times... Um, right now with wars and politics and all that's going on. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of movement. I think things have changed in the vibration. The frequency has sped up, sped up, sped up. And, and the social media has played to that and, and all around. Um, I think that um, people in COVID certainly has a part in that, have fallen, many people fall into that fear level, um, the, the base fear, and they're going back to that survival instinct. Um, so that in that respect, but I think that's where we come in to, to help remind them who they are and bring love to the planet and realize that fear is just a human emotion. It doesn't exist in the spirit. It's not really who you are. That's just the human part. And that's not even real. Fear is an illusion. Only love is real. So, um, so anyway, that's the way that things are now. There's a lot of that going on too, which also is a sense of, um, it could be COVID, social media, whatever. People not, ha not having manners, uh, not having empathy, not caring about people. And that to me is really hard. Um, I don't recognize the earth right now with that mm -hmm. because, and I don't feel a part of it because it's like, wow, it's so disassociated. And in many ways, there's no civility anymore. And that, that's kind of creepy and scary to me. Scary in a sense that I'm aware of that, but it feels, it feels foreign, I guess you'd say. Because in my day, it, again, it's a, we can say it's many things, age progressing, time progressing, state of affairs, which, I, you know, I do believe that things are the way they should be. I think there's a divine principle going on here. and We have to live it out. Um, but regarding, so what can I do in that respect for the day now? Well, I can still be myself. I have to be who I am. And I got to still find that God in people. And I still find the students in people. And just be yourself. And, and I can be, and this is a real good s secret, not a secret, something everybody should live up to. It lives the up. secret? It's a, big, it's a big secret. <laughs> the secret? Well, it kind of could be the secret. Because it, when you get in this mindset, it really helps you in this human life. And that is stepping back. Stepping back and having changing perspective. Stepping back and being objective. Being objective to everything going on. So I tell people, pretend you're in a, in a, uh, in a theater and you're in the audience. And really, human life, you're watching the play go on. You're watching all of those characters interact. Now, if you want to interact, you can go on that stage and become a character and get caught up in all that stuff. Or you can step back and observe it all happening. To me, it's safer, mm -hmm. and you get a lot more out of it from the, all the different possibilities you see and experience in the objectivity. See, when you're objective, your perspective changes. And then you don't have, and then it comes back to your own life 
in human life, let's say families and friends, let's say families are the, most, are the hardest, I think, lessons to learn for many people. And let's say that we just had it here in the States, we had Thanksgiving, and the holidays are coming. So holiday times, a lot of families get together and there's a lot of family drama. So, and old stuff gets triggered for families and childhood stuff and all that, un, you know, all the traumatized, um, unhealed uh, stuff. Uh, so I say to all my clients, everyone, I, I say, instead of getting in the, the drama, of the family, step back and don't have a knee jerk reaction. Don't jump into it. Step back, take two breaths and change your perspective. What are they doing to each other? What are you observing? What are you learning from this? How would you do it differently? Mm -hmm. And many times you find out, Emilio, that in that space, when you're objective, there becomes an awareness of having boundaries. Being, having boundaries, not to say protect ourselves, but being aware of boundaries. In, the, in other words, family members, you can't say that to me anymore. That is not working for me. You have to honor me. Um, my brother, I had this my brother this summer. He was doing old stuff from 20, 30 years ago. I was like, and I stopped it and I said, you won't speak to me that way. That's not right. You can't do that. And he doesn't understand it because he's still in that old mindset. And like, well, you don't get to have me. If you don't respect me, you don't get to have me. And mm -hmm. I think that in our lives, life is so short that we really need people in our lives who all of us to support us. If we have people, our friends, and and people we hang out with, um, who, who support us, that's we support each other. But if you have people in your life that are tearing you down and taking things away from you in any uh, different areas of your life, say bye bye. Life is too short, so you have to have people surrounding you that there's an alignment that brings up expansion and growth, and there's a there's a mindset. One thing I want to say about my school again. One thing I didn't expect was a big surprise, was the sense of community and the sense of like a like-mindedness community. And it really um, has that, and I love learning about that. And really we've become a big community, global community, but a lot of the same mindset. And as you're finding. Yeah. Um, so back to your original, sorry, I'm going all over the place. At 25, mediumship. To me, that was, like you said, I didn't know what he was talking about. But it was um, very strange. He said the spirit will want to use you. Now as a child, I used to have apparitions. I used to see things around the, the movie, The Sixth Sense. I'm not going to say it officially was based on my life, but <laughs> but I had the same agent that M. Night Shakur had and uh, at ICM. Uh -huh. And my book, Talking to Heaven, they wanted to make it to a movie, but it was too nice, right? So they they later made it, CBS made a miniseries, but at that time it came out with Sixth Sense, which was that little boy's experiences were all my experiences. I used to go to the church and see things. And when I'd see spirit, I'd go to the church. I'd see spirit under my bed. And it, it wasn't as creepy and scary as that. But very, it was very, normal for you. It was normal for me. It was. I used to see lights and colors around my friends when we were outside playing in the street in New York playing stickball. And I used to see lights and colors. And I'd say, oh, there's a yellow color. What are you talking about? And who's that man next to you? That guy with the beard and the, what do you see? Were you crazy? And I thought they could all see it because as kids, you're open and you measure your environment, your world, by what you experience. And I was experiencing that. And I thought the rest of them could see that, but they didn't. So I was immediately an outcast. And I stayed an outcast until around, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. But yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? So it's much more open now, uh, obviously. I, I think these um, the diversity we have in the world, I think it forces people to make a choice. It pushes us to a, our sense of self because we really got to back to self. All we have is self, and we got to go back to what's inside of us. And that's that beautiful light and God light. And you know what? There's a good, a wonderful message I say to people, which really helps them too. Um, what other people think of you is none of your business. Because nobody knows you better than you know yourself, right? No one knows you better than yourself, and that's not your experience. So, anyone, so don't give that power. It's very true. What other, what other people think of you has nothing to do with you, you know. <laughs> and to get to that point of what you're speaking on, you had to go through a master degree in compassion. So you've mentioned the spirits that we have on the other side. We have our guides on the other side, the loved ones. Um, a lot of the loved ones that pass on become our spirit guides. That's where I want to bring in your mother yeah. and Sister Teresa. How are they both teaching you compassion? Well, it's very interesting because um, as we go on through the um, time here in this physical world, um, I mean, my mother as well, when, I, when she first passed over in 1985, she did become one of my guides, I found out. And I, I said to that same British medium after I, she had passed and we had our connection, I said to him, why is my mother my spirit guide? And he said, well, James, 
She felt she didn't do enough for you in the physical world, so she wants help in the spiritual world, which is very, very mm-hmm. common. Very, very common. Also for those uh, people in our lives, parents or family or friends, who pass over, they don't feel they've done enough for you in some but other level, and they were stuck or something, they want, or partners, these spouses, they want to help you, so they'll try it. So that they will try that, and it, they, I don't know, it's, it's like they impress you, inspire you in those acts, in those moments when you need more compassion. They will, in some way, inspire your mind to um, open up and have compassion. And the same that Sister Teresa was a, uh, a nun, who I think is not one of my guys, I think she's moved on now, because they come and go, some stay with you for lifetimes or a lifetime, and some are there for very specific work. And her work was to help with compassion. I do say I think I've learned a lot in this space that I do have much more compassion. I have much more patience, although I think I have another guy working on patience with me because these hard times. Um, it's funny, but yeah, so so guides come and go in our lives. Um, and there are some that call career guides that are there for your what you're going to do in the lifetime. When I started as a medium, I became very aware of the guides around me. And there were several doctors that were there who were working on the really? energetic and the human body because the endocrine system was being used and taxed for mediumship. And there were some philosophers around me. Um, there were some um, actors that were around me. Uh, and that made sense to bring out this expression, right? Um, four planets in Leo, so you know, I had to get out before the public. You had to get out there. Get out there. <laughs> get I, on TV, I, real quick. Get out. <laughs> and I've always wanted to get that medium of TV. I always wanted. I always knew I'd be involved in that. I was just thinking about mm. this this morning when I was driving my car back from the airport. I was um, thinking, wow. Um, I remember when I was three years old, and my mother was walking me to nursery school, and someone was talking to her. They just kind of they said, she said, "Where are you from? Where'd you come from? Where's your vacation?" And the man said, "Oh, I came from California." And I looked at my mother and said, I'm going to live there one day. Now, I had no idea what California was. I said, I'm going to live there one day. And I always knew I'd be uh, on television in some way. I always knew I have a broadcasting degree. I thought I'd be a writer. But then I ended up on TV and a producer. But the funny thing is I went to another medium, very, really incredible. The last physical medium that was the most incredible physical medium that was alive it was Leslie Flint. And there were voices that would come in a voice box and uh, speak in the room, and there, it's on the web, it's on the internet. You can look up Leslie Flint and see his site with all the voices that they recorded in those years. And I remember that when I sat with Leslie before everybody got to that the seance room. Leslie was sitting there just chatting. He said, you see that box over there? And it was a television. And I said, yeah. He says, one day you're gonna use that, but you have to use it with respect and integrity. And uh, wow. I have, I have. And I, cause I, I know that when you put something on television or movies, really, you put something out into the airwaves, right? That there's a responsibility because, again, like I did the show Ghost Whisper, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with that that show. Jennifer yeah, Lovett, yeah. and at the beginning of the show, it's a very frightening, fearful that people get a little frightened by ghosts and so forth, and and they like that, and the network liked it, did really well, and they want to do that at the end of the show. And I said, no, 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 I cannot be associated with that. I said, I will not be associated with, associated with this show if you don't end it on a loving note. You have to raise that vibration and it's got to be a healing at the end of that show. And they said, well, we'll test it and see. And I said, it's going to work well. And it sure enough did because it ends in love. It ends in healing every show. And I think that's a responsibility of production producers, really. It's a responsibility yeah. of producers to put love out there. Listen, when those credits roll, everybody better be feeling good and, and healed and open in some way. You can learn, of course. You can discover new things. But it's got to be a positive I, I don't like things going to the negative or the fear. Again, it, it's power, you know, this energy that you're giving out. So anyway, that's wow. that's what I'm about. <laughs> so that's happy to say that's and what I'm spreading. And you're yes, spreading. 100%. And we will we'll definitely get into physical mediumship. But now that we went into the topic of Hollywood and producing, I'm really curious to know, how have you transmuted, how else have you transmuted uh, maybe the darker side of Hollywood? Because I know <laughs> um, Hollywood is wow. util- utilizing mediumship uh, in many ways right now. I wish it was um, the martini, but it's not. <laughs> to- <laughs> I have cacao. Hope- oh, hopefully that, that, that works. <laughs> I, I have um, LaCroix. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what is your question? Because it's so you have such full questions. So the transmutation of the darker side of Hollywood, because I know they always want to present an image of something. Yeah. Um, in this case, we're talking about mediumship, which is such a sacred ability. It's just such yeah. a sacred process. Yeah. 
So how have you transmuted that and gone around that in many ways well, to you know, you know, end in love? Emilio, the hard thing is, and, and that is just my, my sense of self, I had to come to terms with that. I can't change everyone because I'm just me. I can't, I don't have enough of that. Um, and none of us can. You know, people say, what are you going to do with the world right now and the crisis it's in and conflict? How can we change things? And I say the same thing is that, you know, in order to change the macrocosm, you first got to change the microcosm. So you got to be, you know, aware of your own space and how that's going to change. And hopefully perhaps there'll be a rippling effect, right? There'll be a rippling effect to mm -hmm. others. And with the, with the world of entertainment, um, I, 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 I do what I can do. Um, when I worked, I had to go all the way back to when I had a TV show. Well, when I used to do regular guest appearances and stuff like that, I became aware of producers and this and that. I became aware of uh, interesting uh, uh, people that were hosting television shows, just I'll name them, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and Oprah and all that. And I could see very clearly, being that Virgo part, um, how they behaved in Analytical. the audience and how they behaved in, on the TV when the camera started and how they behaved when the camera was off. And that was always a shock. Always a shock. Always. Wow. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. So I thought, wow, they're not really that way. They don't walk their talk. These people do not walk their talk. They're one way. Uh, wow. And I was like, that was shocking. That was really shocking to me. I was like, okay, that was my first lesson in that. And then I learned when I, um, spirituality and entertainment, boy, it's like a, it's a roller coaster ride. It's like, whoa, you got to really know your stuff and hold on because it can be really dark. Um, I just had a, I, you know, I had to be me. I had to be me. And the more one knows oneself and honors their self, they have to. Uh, in Ghost Whisper, I hired the producer of the show. I worked close with CBS and Touchstone Television. And I hired these two producers, executive producers, and I thought they're, they're a good team. Um, well, well, let me go back first before that. I had a show called Beyond, and that was an episodic yeah. show. And at the executive producer, I did a reading for her at the very beginning of the pilot because I wanted to make sure she understood the sacredness. And I brought through a twin that died, a baby of hers. I said, there's a girl here, she's a twin of a boy that you have. And she says, yes, it's exactly right. And I was like, wow, that's really great. And she understood it. Well, she forgot it very quickly when we did the show because when we were doing the show, um, I separated myself in a separate building because I didn't want to have skeptics saying, oh, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't have done that. I should have been in charge there because they open themselves up to this world they knew nothing about. And I was literally doing five shows, um, no, more than that, nine shows a week, from five in the morning to like five, and reading the audiences twice, and reading personal readings, and I was I was spent. Um, but once I remember I was there, and, and I was an executive producer on it too, but I was sitting doing a reading for a lady, and in the, in the corner of my eye, in the, in the side of the stage, there was an associate producer, and she's holding up a sign that said, make her cry. And I'm like, oh. what? I stopped tape, I said, stop tape, and I had to do a whole diva thing. And I said, stop it, because all the people in the audience, and this woman, I mean, come on, you don't do this. Don't yeah, disrespect yeah. the work. So I walked up to the, booth, the control room and I said, don't you ever do that again, don't you ever. And then I had to go, one, she said, okay, okay. And then a couple months later, we did these mur she did murder shows, murders, I'm like, one murder, because I didn't know what the situation was. There was one murder after another. And after like a Wednesday of four murders, I said, you can't give me another murder. I can't do this. It's draining. You can't. Okay, we won't do it anymore. Just one more today, and that's it. I said, are you promising me? Yes. The next morning, I wake in, and there's a story about a murder. And all I get was a piece of paper saying, murder, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I said, not doing it. And I locked myself in my dressing room. I had, I had to go down to that level. That you got to do those diva moments. Oh, my <laughs> God. I had to be a diva. And I'm not a diva. But, but that's how she'll understand this, I guess. I had to lock the door. The My agents came in. The head of the studio came in. They, and I said, no. And I had, you have to honor the work. And if you don't do it, then I'm not doing this. So I won. And having to get to those levels, bad. Then the other thing was, just some stupid stories here, dark stories people don't know about. Um, really interesting. I hired the two producers, the executive producers over at Ghost Whisper, uh, Kim and Ian Sanders, uh, Kim San Ian Moses, Kim Moses, Ian Sanders. And I hired them. And uh, the Jennifer Love You and I went out and made a real success of promoting that, marketing that show. Really, we did really well. And we got to number one on Fridays. And after it was really successful in a year, the executive producers, I was a co-executive, they wouldn't let me executive, but it was my idea. And they did the budget for the new season. And they said, um, we're not going to need you. I said, excuse me? We're not going to need you. We're cutting the budget. We don't need your, your services. I said, wait, wait a minute here. I hired you. You didn't hire me. I hired you. No, 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 no. And um, really, CBS, Les Moonves says, no, no, no. He's staying on the show. 
No. So I just stay, I stayed in the show and I was like, wow, how could they just disrespect that whole? And that's a typical Hollywood thing. And uh, years mm-hmm. later, the show ended, I thought, I'm not getting paid the money I deserve. And myself and I got Jennifer Love Hewitt and other producers to go back to a deal with Touchstone because f- remember the show Friends, they all went there and they got their money. And I thought, I'm not going to let this money, there's money out there to get DVD rights and all these other rights. So I sent my attorney and worked with certain entertainment attorneys of theirs. And we went back to Touchstone and we won. We won all the rights of DVDs mm-hmm. and other auxiliary rights, which they were going to hold on to. So I don't like to get to that level. But the, the, and, and, and then when I did the show, Ghost Whisper, I asked Spirit, I said, why, you, why is this happening? Why would you do this? And why would they put this frightening things in all these people? And they said to me, James, calm down, calm down. The most important thing is the bigger picture, which is when people see the show, they're going to question, is there life after death? And that'll get them on their journey. Like, D. it was the human of me thing. Okay, duh. duh. <laughs> so, but I had to go through it, you know, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one, but, you know, it is what it is. Before I go on to in the Universal lot in LA, I would sit by the side of the 101 freeway and go through a whole protection of energy and I'd surround myself with energy because I used to go in that lot and you're getting left and right, you're getting things thrown at you. Bombarded. Like, oh my yeah. gosh, producers being dishonest and actors and depletion and greed and greed and dishonesty. And it's like, Bleh. so I had to protect myself every time I went on that lot. <laughs> yeah. And there's the joy again. You got to bring yourself that sense of humor and look at it and say, this is all so goofy. It just doesn't make sense. So, well, <laughs> you know, you step back and you have the objectivity of it and the perspective, it helps a lot. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to see it as a game and you mentioned at the end you know people are questioning themselves is there life after death and a lot of you know the people that we've also brought on the show are near-death experiencers i know you've had a near-death yeah. experience which we can get into yeah. a little bit later yeah. but i'd love to walk people through what what a a soul can go through when they cross over to the other side you mentioned that in the beginning, they go to an astral or, or lower realm. Right. We can get into life review, the adjustment period, okay. all of that. What what really happens in sure. maybe a step by step process? A, a, a good question, Amelia. A very good question. And um, I'm going to just throw this out to everybody that um, based upon your ex- uh, own life experiences. So let's say you're someone who's very religious, whatever religion that might be, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Judaism, doesn't matter, right? This is your belief system. That's that gets you. I believe we'll get to religion another time, but. It doesn't matter, right? So, but some people might have that mindset, right? So when they passed over, like my mother was very Catholic, and when she passed over, there was a priest that came to get her because that was her way of thinking. So you will have that, and many times people are just totally religious and they don't think anything else. They will be met by a figure that looks like Jesus to help them over, and they know it's their way over. So a spirit will bring them to help the to transition. They will have that if the person really was religious, they'll have that that form there, that that reality. Most of the time, we find. And depending upon the type of death it is. So when someone has a serious, like a a real serious illness that drains the body for a long time, they might, we might find that they first pass over to the other side. Leaving the body is easy. Leaving the body is, it's like taking a breath. It's like taking the other last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was, I was, I was sick with um, COVID pneumonia. It was great. And, um, I, because I was traveling too much and yeah, it was pretty trippy, but I learned from it. And what it was, was, the sense of death I got, and I was lying there coughing, I'm thinking, well, I know death has to be easier than this. And, and what it was, was I had the image of taking a sheet off, and that was it. And that was death slipping off. It's a slipping away. So death is, is not hard or difficult. No one should fear death at all. It's very natural. Was that your near-death experience? No, that you just no, that's just two weeks oh, ago. Okay. <laughs> two oh, weeks wow. Ago. Oh, yeah, wow. but I had that awareness of it's just, it's just, my sister had passed over in April and she was very mediumistic and she's been communicating with me, but I know my, you know, I just am aware of that. She's trying to give me things that she didn't, that she'd experienced once they helped me out. She's working around me now too. But, and she might have helped me with that slipping of the sheet thing. But it's really, you go to a space where, again, there's no pain in death. Leading up to it might be painful with, you know, cancers or diseases, but scientists have been influenced, inspired to create inventions of medicines for pain. So the human being should never suffer. That's not the way it should be. Humans should not suffer. So when you pass out of the physical 
Um, and we do it every night. We go to sleep, by the way. The soul leaves the body, the crown. Um, we go to an, a place, which is an astral world, they call it, which is very much a replica of the physical world. You have trees and gardens and flowers, um, brighter and, and more more alive than we could even imagine. My, my friend Olivia, who I knew for 35 years and went to many different things together in England and America as far as healers and uh, mediums and different explorations. She was always exploring and so was I. And we had a deal and the deal was um, the agreement when one was passed, so whoever passes over first needs to come right back and tell us what the experience is. So I, I live in San Diego and I'm driving down the, one of the streets here and I'm, all of a sudden I see her face on the windshield. And I hadn't spoken to her in about probably six months. I'm like, Olivia, An apparition. she's dead. She goes, I said, Olivia, are you dead? She goes, no, you're the dead one. I'm alive. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they describe it. They were the walking dead. And I went back to my, uh, my, my office and I typed her. I, I looked at my email and her daughter wrote me from Australia. And she said, I have some sad news. My mom, Olivia, passed away this morning. And her back said, oh, I know. She's already come to me. And then Olivia, I said, Olivia, show me everything. She said, well, and she was speaking to me with this British accent that she had. She said, it was quite unbelievable. Now, this is a woman who had experiences of mediumship, of awareness of the other side. She goes, it was quite unbelievable. She goes, it was if I was walking into a theater. And she goes, and it was full of people, crowds in the theater. And they were all looking up at the screen. And I walked right into that screen. And it was flowers and gardens. And it was met by all these people that, that knew me somehow. And she said, it wasn't only my family and friends. It was people that it, I did kindnesses for. I opened a door for someone. I smiled at someone once five, 50 years ago. All this other thing. She goes, I had an imprint on all those people and they came to welcome me home. And she goes, and they looked back at the audience in the seats and they all were staring like they were asleep. And she said, I was, my, but all those people I left an imprint with, which I thought was really important, right? Oh, wow. All those little, little um, things we do, little things we say. Um, so it's all, it's all meaningful, it touches them. So we go to this world, which is very real. We see our loved ones. They come to get us, to greet us and bring us over. And many times you're brought to your mother's house. Now, that's interesting. So another friend of mine just recently passed and said they were met at the mother's house. No, I'm sorry. It was a lady I had on my podcast last night. And she said, um, when her husband passed over, he was met by his mother in her house and she gave him a bagel. He was a very Jewish guy, right? And he had a bag, he used to bagels with his mother. And he said it, it looked just like his mother's old house. So what they do, the spirit people will create in their consciousness a form of the old house exactly like it was on the earth. Exactly. Down to teacups, down to the furniture patterns. And most people, they might have this experience for an adjustment period. It's really just an adjustment period. They want to feel comfortable. So, if they need it. See, they, not everybody needs that because some people are more spiritually aware that there's going to be the other side, what it's going to be like. And um, But there are many things over there we have here and, and then some, like lakes and, and water and trees and gardens and buildings, uh, mm -hmm. buildings of incredible uh, stature and presence. And and we, we once we realize we have, everybody goes to their um, funeral or memorial service. We find that most of the men are looking at what the suit, how much it's going to cost. And the women are saying, who sent the flowers, right? But, and, and many times they'll look at their, if their body is laid out and if they'll say, Oh my God, what, you know, why'd they put so much makeup on me? Or my father said, and his said, Oh, thanks for putting my teeth in. I look pretty good. And we all heard it. It was pretty funny, but they go to all their services. And I think that's helping their adjustment as well. I think that helps their adjustment, mm. but you go back to the prime of your life. So it could be, anywhere from you know 20 to 35, whatever you want to go back to. And many times people pass over, can't walk, they have, everything's back to a wonderful younger version of themselves. They're able to walk, they're able to do things they've never done before. If they had a desire to play the piano, but they never had the time here, over there they're able to do that. So it's a wonderful world of many different possibilities. And that's why it's called heaven, see? So yeah, so I look forward to that day. <laughs> it's gonna yeah. be great. Me too. I know I got work to here, but I, I I look forward to that day one day. Yeah, there's no fear. Of, not at of all going to that world. Oh, not at all. I'm more afraid of the living than of the dead. I'm more afraid of this world, what human beings are doing, what they can do. Uh, I'm more afraid of ignorance, really. Uh, I, I I love knowledge and wisdom, but I'm afraid of ignorance. I'm afraid of ignorance and power with ignorance. That's bad. Yeah, yeah that's bad. Power with ignorance. And that's wealth. a powerful combo. Yeah, <laughs> not a exactly. good one. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that's why um, we need our work to be done, Emilio, to open up the minds and hearts of people. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned that the spirit world is essentially a mental world. And that's how when these spirits cross over, they could recreate 
their mother's house where they could recreate, you know, maybe their favorite childhood spot. Essentially, what's the difference um, between the spirit world being a mental world? Are we also because in quantum physics now we know they're saying, you know, this is this is all mental as well. So is it both a mental world? Just one is more real or potent what what is that distinction yeah. so, like? so so look think of it this way there let's think of it as bands they're different bands and and um different levels if you will but not just not just separated as you know full there, there's different levels of those bands if you will right so like consciousness we know can be different levels of consciousness right and physicality can be physical different levels of physicality we are also mental beings here and we can think of something and really kind of try to manifest it and it will manifest eventually because we're limited in time and space here. So the vibration of the molecules moving, if you will, it's very limited here. It moves, the molecules um, vibrate and electrons vibrate very slowly here in this human vibration. Three dimensional world, very slow. And spirit will talk about, oh, I don't like going back to that world because it's like so slow. And they're a much faster vibration. Um, I, I like to use an analogy like a ceiling fan. When you look at the fan and it's not on, you see the individual blades. But if you turn the electric on and it moves quickly, you have a hard time seeing those individual blades. It all becomes one. Same thing with us. It's hard for us now, many people in the human, to see the spirit people around them, to see colors, to see those, because we're at a faster frequency. So in mediumship, I'm able to bring up my frequency and we get a glimpse of these things. So we are that. We just right now, so here in this three-dimensional world, if we put our minds and hearts here, we lose out on all that. Um, so when, but again, so if, if I go back to, if you want something, you think of something, you create it with your thoughts and you really visualize, visualize that and stay detailed with those thoughts, it will manifest. You'll have exactly what you thought, exactly what you thought will happen. Now in the spirit world, because it's such a fast vibration, you just think of something and, and we can say it's a mental vibration. There's a physical vibration in its glory. That's a mental vibration in its glory. Again, but there are levels and bands, if you will. So in that world, you just think of something and it's created. And, and, and that's really what it is. So if you want uh, your favorite drink, if let's say you were an alcoholic, and you pass over and think, I miss those, um, I don't know, uh, whiskey. Well, then you, rip, you can have it right there and that's your whiskey. And you drink it and it tastes like whiskey because you have a memory of it. It's not real whiskey, but your memory it remembers that. So it won't, it won't give you the hit or belt or whatever you call it for, for whiskey or alcohol, but you remember that. So what happens is when you're first in that world of the astral world, you get accustomed to being outside the physical vibration and you're very aware of the uh, energetic levels and that you've passed over. But after a while, the sensations kind of, you don't need them anymore. Like you might have loved hamburgers. Well, guess what? You won't, you'll have that over, you can have it, but eventually, It'll st you don't need that. You don't need to sustain life with food. So you work, you, you, you live out those experiences. You won't need buildings per se, or you won't need to have certain things. And you move on to a higher level, if you will. They say there are two deaths. That's the first death. And the second death is when you cessation, the, the cessation of all those things that you feel you need, whether it's food, whether it's clothing, whether it's sports, whatever it might be, you don't need them. And you get back to that oneness, that love, that vibration. Then you go to those, the second death, a higher level, where you tend then to do mm -hmm. your soul's work. And your soul's work can be anything from mission work to helping uh, people that pass over with uh, drug addicts passing over. And most of the times I find that people that help drug addicts, it's a big thing now with fentanyl and all that. The ones that help them over Oof, are the ones that yeah. passed over that way because they have that experience. They're there that's gonna really help those people that pass over that way. Same thing with military. I once went through a man who had died in the military of a suicide, by the way. And when he came back to his wife, he said, I was met by my brothers and sisters, which was new to me, because I never heard that. And I said, he's telling me he was met by his brothers and sisters because we made a pact when we took on this condition of the service, we'll always be brothers and sisters. And they carry that over to the other side. And it was just very interesting. So you can live out those wonderful experiences, expressions of your being, and those expressions of your desires. But when those desires are finalized and met, then you can move on to other levels. Hmm. <laughs> I hope that makes what sense. I'm, what I'm sort of what I'm integrating right now is that the first death that you mentioned serves as that adjustment period, right. and that's a moment where we still have. And this this also goes to my question. Um, it seems like we still have our ego, consciousness, and identity with us because. You know, if I liked whiskey on this life, then in my adjustment period, I'll, I'll still crave that. 
And then when we finally let go of detachment, do we dissolve the ego identity as well? Or what happens? The, the, there's always going to be a personality. So there's, there's a soul personality, right? So in each lifetime, if, with my understanding, for each lifetime you build upon that personality. So this personality builds and builds and builds. So that's a soul. Per- so when you pass over to the side of life, I believe that you're also met in with their soul personality. Now, when I say that to you, let's go back to that part where I'm, I was saying that we're in the physical world. We're aware of this part, but 70% is out here. So, and that's not connected with physical vibration. That's, that could be, you can experience several lifetimes at once on those other sides. And part of your soul is not just one. It could be many aspects of your soul, many multiples of yourself you think of. And when you pass the other side of vibration, you become aware of all those different aspects of your soul who are having a lifetime in that galaxy, in that galaxy. And, And you'll come back. And you have, is that an interesting one? That makes sense to me. You become more aware of that your wholeness of your being, of all these different aspects of your soul and what you need, right, to, to bring that together. And I think when you pass over, you get that awareness of the wholeness of the soul. And now, if I can go to this, it's funny then, when I do mediumship and someone comes to me and understandably the human is grieving and they want that person to come back and to give them that nickname well, that soul has moved on to all these different things and to come back to one little tiny thing. It's, and you, you know, you have to, of course, be uh, compassionate to the person, but, and you can't really tell everybody about this stuff because they would totally wouldn't understand it. But I do believe that there's that higher aspects of ourselves that we become more aware of when we step out of the physical body. And, and I'm going to tell you this right now, that force of the source of life that's in every living thing, the prana, as we call it, um, I think the more in tune you get with that while you're in the physical, it's you're going to become more aware of that when you pass over, and it'll help with your transition. It'll help with your 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 expansion. Um, and I just I got to tell you, I just get that sense. I do it every day, and whether it's a walking meditation, I just attune myself to the plants, the flowers, the animals. I just just because I want to, there's that oneness. You know, I believe everything is one, right? One O N E, omnipresent, nurturing energy. And people ask me, what is love? I said, love is one, omnipresent, nurturing energy. And we're all one. The biggest two biggest illusions we have in this three-dimensional world is separativeness. We're not separate. We're not alone. We're together. We're one. And the second is death. There is no death. That's an illusion, right? So if we understand both those, we can start opening our eyes and taking some walks and moving on. <laughs> right? Huh. <laughs> And one I may add to that is also fear, which which goes hand in hand with separation. One question I had is, but that's coming through right now is, there has to be a purpose for for physical death, for fear, for separateness. Have you had any insights onto what that is? Why our soul created this earthly experience, this physical experience? So that we could learn, or, or what is bingo? Going on? It's, it, I think it's all about learning. I think this is a, the Earth is one school for the soul. This is their school for our soul. We come back here to learn. It's a hard school. There are millions of schools for the soul. Millions, millions of galaxies. We're just one. When my my guide, someone in the audience asked once, but you know, where is the Earth on the on the you know ladder of spiritual evolution? And they said. Was <laughs> the Earth people? It's like a, the Earth is like a grain of sand on the beach, just <laughs> all the different levels. So the Earth level, think of it as a, the souls come back to this Earth for different reasons. It's all learning, but this place gives wonderful opportunities, rich opportunities to grow and to learn that other galaxies, other schools, and the universes wouldn't. So this is a place that baby souls can come back, and baby souls can experience war and power and money and then think that that's the all and that's the end all that's everything and there are you know the postgraduate souls that come here to bring healing and understanding and passion and love and then you also have the middle souls who are still you know in between the baby and the postgraduate is still learning and because you have all the diversity there the you know the baby souls the postgraduate souls the middle souls it forces them all of us then to have these scenarios these experiences to act out and through those scenes that we act out, we can go within ourselves and say, how would I handle that? What are the choices I do here? How is that person influencing me? If they don't know themselves, it's going to be harder to make the right choice, right? But the ones that are postgraduates might have a better understanding and can help those to move on and teach them. So it gives us, it affords us an opportunity to have many, many different scenarios in order for the soul to experience, to go through various uh, 
uh, situations of the human to understand, to go within, to to help. There's so many opportunities here that you won't get in other, other schools. This is a rich place to come back to. And there are many souls that want to come back here, by the way, to change things up. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to bring to the surface some important human issues as well that tie into the spiritual experience as well. I know you've had many experiences with clients um, where their loved one passed away in a tragic death or a fatal collision. Maybe they were driving their car and a drunk driver hit them and they had to pass away to the other side. How does that play into what you call the immutable natural law of the universe of cause and effect? What is going on there? Uh, I as love well? that. That's a good way of putting it. You ask these full questions, and it's, you've been reading my books. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because, of course, every situation is different. We could say it that way. But as you said, I've been through many, many experiences of people that have um, every type of death I've, I've experienced it. I really have. It's whether it's suicide, whether a gun to the head, whether a decapitation, whether a car accident, whether I mean everything, poison, uh, wrongful death, uh, drowning murders. I've been through it all. I've been through all of it. Falling off ma uh, a mountain. Um, so many ones. And the one thing to remember is it doesn't matter how one dies because you don't feel anything. So I always say God in its wondrous way has used a shut off valve. So we're unconscious of, of the pain. We kind of lose even um, plane, a lot of plane accidents I've done. And it, they, they lose consciousness. There's a, a shift of consciousness. And we know that. We know that here in the human world where people have gone through a car accident, but they're alive. They say, yeah, I don't remember what happened. Over and over again. So we have that. So um, many times, again, it depends on the individual situation or the or that soul group, that soul in the soul group. But for instance, let's say somebody has... Um, um, an accident and they become um, uh, disabled. They, it just happened with those three boys and, and the horrible thing with the three uh, Arab boys that were shot in Vermont here. I never heard about that, but they were shot because they were speaking Arabic. And I was like, what? what? So one of those poor guys, I mean, my heart goes to them and their families. One of the poor guys, he's, he's disabled. He won't be able to walk. So he's not gonna be able to walk. He's gonna be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Now, that opportunity was like, wow. And one way that, that is, as I can say, I'm just going to throw this out. It could be one, it could be many things, but one example, maybe that that soul family, that, that, that's, that, that boy, that soul, and his family chose that experience to happen in the future so that not only could he grow spiritually by letting himself go through this, but also those souls in his soul group they have to learn about how taking care of him. They got to have more compassion. They'll probably care about people thinking of how they are, their their background. Their you know, many things come up. So it affords a wonderful, valuable lesson. So I think that um, we go through these all these different things. Everything is a lesson to learn. And I think that before we come back into this lifetime, that we go through um, um, a kind of a curriculum of what our upcoming course is going to be. And there are certain things that are called destiny points. Where you have to go through this, you got to go through that, and you got to, th and those things will happen for various reasons, whether for your own soul's growth or the group of soul's growth or the world's soul growth. So, but there is also free will, and the free will can get involved, and free will can change the variance a bit. You'll always have certain destiny points. So, say if you're walking down, you're hiking down this trail. You're supposed to be hiking down this trail. That's your destiny point to hike down. Now you might find there's a light, beautiful lake over there. I'm gonna go sit down by the lake. So. Your free will is to take that choice, sit by the lake, and you can stay there as long as you want to. But eventually, you'll get back on the path again. And that happens. So it's also, if you see free will, um, that there are two souls that come together. Let's say two souls meet each other on a computer or in person or however at the job, and they want to go have a cup of coffee. Well, they're destined to meet, and they're destined to meet and have that cup of coffee. They're destined to be with each other. Now, their free will might say, it's been nice to meet you. i got to go. So thank you very much. I'm moving on. Or it might be that they both chose that that is their destiny to be with each other for, for a long time and have a relationship. But also it might be the free will. It's like, uh-uh, not for me. I'm going to move on. It's mm -hmm. easier to make the right choice in our lives and, and be in tune or aligned with our destiny points the more we know ourselves. The more we know ourselves, the more connection we have with who we are, we know the right choice for ourselves. And you're not relying on your head, the rational mind to get in the way. You want to go to your heart space. Yeah. And it's powerful knowing that we came down here with a group as well. You mentioned the soul group and how when one goes through this massive transformation or shift 
it affects the whole group. So I'd love to know what is your insight and knowledge about soul groups? Do we all come in with a certain number of people? Are they large groups? Are they like more like tight knit? Like this is my click type of group or what, what is that like? That's a, that's a very human question of you, Emilio. I'm very surprised, <laughs> very limited. <laughs> um, before I get to that, let me just go on to something else. I just remember this other great uh, example of, of soul learning. When many, I work a lot with parents that lose children and whether it's a car accident, whether it's a drug overdose, it's all different ways. and. It, some of them are given this opportunity, and it's up to them what they're going to do with that. So you can have a parent, and this could be any death really, where that person becomes so victimized that that death, they become a, a, a professional griever, right? And they're, they, they put themselves, I lost my child, and that's going to be the rest of life. Or that's an opportunity for that soul to grow and question their own spirituality, which many times happens, thank goodness, that happens a lot, and they can change the world uh, and, and help people that are grieving, parents that are grieving. A friend of mine did that with her son that passed over. When I did a reading for over 25 years ago, 30 years ago, and she said to me on the, the, at the time, I can't go on, I can't live, Peter was my life, Peter was my life, I can't go on. I said, no, Peter's here saying, you have to do your work, his work and your work, it's part of the soul group work. And you have to, you're gonna write mm -hmm. books, you're gonna help people, parents that heal. And see, she's since done that, which is fantastic. But I, I think that was our agreement. So I think there are agreements among many souls who come together. Now, if we could think of, I, I don't know, I, I'm really, I, I think that there are many souls around who you share many lifetimes with. And I think there are many souls that have an affinity toward each other. We can say, you know, we've done several classes. Let's do this other class on Earth. Um, and while maybe the other souls in your group might be working in a different space or a different planet or, or star system, compare because those stars maybe that's that's high graduate work or that's a different type of work and these souls need to finish up down the earth work so i think it's kind of more like that where are they where is there an affinity to work and i think that's really what it's about when my sister passed over she came back with something and it said something which i really was interesting and surprised she said james we're all part of worlds within worlds within worlds there are different worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds and she says and we're a part of those different worlds so it, it reminds yeah. me of, I, I know you've had this, the dandelion, you know, a dandelion, and you have the stem and you blow it, and all those little seeds yeah. go everywhere. Kind of like that, I think, you know? That's, that's <laughs> from the source to the <laughs> separation, the big bang. Right. Um, I had another, we could call it a, a maybe human question as well, okay. but it also I has a spiritual, fun. it has a spiritual blanket over yeah. it. Um, and it's a serious topic as well. Okay. Uh, you mentioned it in one of your books about capital punishment, um, the death penalty. And you said that when a person is violently taken out of the physical body before the predetermined natural time, there are spiritual consequences. So maybe a, a question that society can start pondering over, if that's something that we want to include in our system, what are the consequences? Well, not more you never kill people, no matter what it is, whether it's murdering people or, or killing people in capital punishment, it's murder. Who are you to play God? I don't care what they've done. And what I meant by that, and that when I wrote that was, you know, you don't kill the spirit. The spirit is very, very alive. And, and you have a responsibility to release that spirit. You have a responsibility. What have you done? You have not only put your anger and your upset and the, the hate onto that soul, you put that out there to them. And, and, you never know what things happen. You never know mental disease. You never know if certain things push someone to take that, that act. And no, it isn't right. But who are we to say we're to play God and get that out there? And then when that soul leaves that body, they're, they're met with all this energy of negativity and, and upset and hate and all that. And they get, not every soul, but they have, we have to open ourselves up to the realization that some of those souls are pissed. Some of those souls are angry. They're really angry. How dare you take my life? How They might get that mindset. Maybe they're unevolved. And they might get that mindset of, how dare you? I'm going to get back at you. And I believe they'll go back to the earth levels and they might be around those people that created that, that hate or whatever and start, like we say, inspiring or influencing or be around them. You know, mm -hmm. when we talk about earthbound spirits, I don't necessarily believe in earthbound spirits, but I do believe that those sojourn spirits, those spirits are released have the opportunity to go and influence negative things around people. And until we take the time to stop and treat every life, I don't care who it is, with respect and sacredness and to honor what that soul is going through, we humans might not like what they've done, and it's wrong to take a life. And it's not right for us to take a life. 
how, what better, you know, when you, when you, I don't know, it's like when you kill somebody or you put someone down, you're not, you're as bad as they are. You're not any better. If you're going to kill them, you're any better than they were murdering someone. You killed them. What good is that? You know, it's as bad as they did. So that's what I meant by that. <laughs> yeah. And I think you summed it up in who are we to play God? Who are yeah, we to we determine to someone's too. destiny? Oh, my shade here. Excuse me. <laughs> Get more light in the subject. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Awesome. That's better. <laughs> Something that occurred to you when you started opening up is that you know when when a lot of people start opening up very like very fast you know they start psychically opening up and a lot of things are coming through you might encounter um you talked about you you use the word succubus um oh my, these yeah. entities or darker forces how do we keep ourselves protected um in a way when we're opening up to all the different frequencies when we're opening up psychically what has been your experience with that when you're teaching people yeah, who are developing yeah succubus oh remember those I, when i first and you're going right back to talking to heaven my first book and my experience was that my experience was when i was opening up um and just opening up those different levels of reality i guess you'd say i was in a space where and it wasn't that i opened up too fast but I had to learn it this way, that the human could understand it, that I could understand it. I was just about to um, come back into the body. You know, we leave the body every night, we go to sleep. And sometimes we're just about to fall asleep and we shake. It's because your soul is not leaving the correct access to the body, which is a crown chakra. It might be off and it feels like we're on a roller coaster falling off a mountain, we come right back in. And there's gotta be just a perfect way out there. And, and also in the morning, we come back, we get back to consciousness of the human, we go down to these levels and we get back to the human. I was coming back to those, those levels. And the way I was perceiving it was coming down this hollow kind of canyon area. And it's coming down and these fragments of being, people are reaching out their hands, their face, like, ah, they're grabbing me. And I was like, oh, and it made me frightened. And for some reason, I, 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 I knew within me to say, are you of God? And all of a sudden, it, phew, it dissipated. I was like, oh, there we go. So the, really what it means is when you're opening up to those different levels of awareness, which, you know, we do that intuitively, psychically. In my courses, I teach this. You have to go step by step. You can't be grunt right into it. And, and, and it works with that sense of love. So if I'm opening myself up, I want to first have a sense of true love of self. And that loving energy that never dies. It, it's just it's who you are. And the, there's a wonderful universal law of like attracts like. And if you have this loving energy around you, surrounding yourself with love, that power of love. In the courses I teach about sitting in the power of love, bringing your power up in that sense, riding that wave of love, trying to be with that all the time. And that's really important when you're opening yourself up onto different levels of consciousness because the human, get, the mind can get thrown. You know, if you're not ready, um, especially with mediumship. I mean, people, students of mine tend to jump into it and just go all the way. I'm like, no, 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 step by step. For me, the most powerful part of my mediumship development was the development itself, was what I was learning as I opened myself up to these different levels. It was like, wow, I see the expansion of the aura. I saw myself in a different way. And you always have that have to the sense of, what am I learning from this? What am I gonna learn? What am I, you always be that student. And the, it's so valuable, the development is so valuable Again, it's going to affect the quality of your work. So the quality of the mediumship will change. And there are a lot of people that just want to get mediumship going, want to be well-known. Well, it's the wrong thing. It's just the wrong thing. It's got to be a progression. You can't be, um, you know, you, you can't bake yourself too early. You can't be undercooked. You got to be fully cooked. You can't go out there undercooked. Because again, it's not a, a, it's not a justice to yourself or any other other person, you have humans in your hands. You're taking care of people. It's like, I often say it's like thin a thin piece of glass. You're holding them in your hand. You can break them quite easily if you're not prepared for this. And we get a lot of work with people that have, all, like I said, all the types of deaths and human belief systems and negativity. And you've got to be aware of what you're dealing with here. We wear many hats, you know, doing this type of work. And if you're not willing to step up and to learn who you are and to come from a pace of love of self and self power of love, um, you can be hurt. You can be hurt mentally, physically, emotionally. Yeah, you can, be you can be taken down very easily if you're not integrated in all those bodies and all those parts of yourself. Mm. I have to say that. You, it's not just yeah. ooh, woo woo, it's, it's really serious work to me. Because um, I've seen many students who have not progressed, I mean, not developed correctly, and they end up in physical harm. 
uh, whether it's cancers or the adrenal system is burned out, the endocrine system is messed up, you know, or they get, you know, they're off to some emotional stuff gets them. You got to be really fully integrated and really know yourself in order to get out there. As you said the word integrated, another one that popped into my mind was integrity. And you mentioned that integrity and respect as, you know, when we were talking about the Hollywood, the respect and integrity for mediumship. What other cornerstones have you found to be able to do this work in the world is super important. Responsibility, big one. Mm, responsibility, like Spider-Man? Responsibility, compassion. Compassion goes hand in hand with empathy. Um, integrity, responsibility, um, honesty. You know, but again, those three go together to me, compassion, honesty. Yeah, so those are the ones I'd say. And um, you gotta honor yourself. You know, you really do have to have that sense of who you are. And you know, I go on stage and I make I make a fool of myself. I I get out there and go dancing as I introduce myself, and people are like, huh? But they love it. Now, why am I doing that? I'm doing it for a very specific reason. I'm doing that number one to make them feel comfortable. Like, oh, this guy's not serious. Death is not serious. Why is he treating this so light? Because it is light. When you realize there's no death, it's a joyful thing. So number one, it puts their defenses down. They can enjoy the moment and experiences. Like, this guy's kind of funny, but he's kind of real, but. And then is ready for the, they're open then. They're open with humor because humor opens people up, raises the vibration, right? Raises the vibration, opens them up, and then I'm able to talk to them. And they trust me because I'm giving them something. Humor brings them in. Everyone can relate to humor. Everyone can relate to a joke. They can relate to, you know, self-deprecating work, you know, the, self, the humor. And they can really relate to that and, and say, wow, it's pretty good. I feel, I feel safe here. And when they get to that moment of feeling safe, then I can work right then it can work then the room is ready to work i've created that space for them now they're ready to receive the true teachings and what that teaching is you know talking to spirit learning what they say it's all that um an interesting time and you know you have to be in charge of it whether it's a one-on-one -on -one reading or a stage reading you got to be in charge the hardest audience I ever had was new york that's a hard audience i'm from new york <laughs> Hard audience. I was once at a, a theater there, 2,000 people, I think. And it was an evening that was, uh, Hillary Clinton was doing a book signing and David Blaine was doing a magic act down the street. It was packed. And I remember I came out on stage and it was about seven o'clock. And I walk out on stage and people are screaming all over the place, screaming, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. I'm like, oh no, I, myself, I gotta go hold this audience right away. And you have to. And, and you know, I was letting it go on. Come to me, come to me, come to me. I was like, I'll wait for the exact moment. And all of a sudden, you, the one voice louder than all the rest was coming up at the top of the left uh, balcony. And it was this lady who said, well, if my brother Johnny came to you, what would he say? Being from New York, I can get away with this. And everybody <laughs> heard her say this. And I said, well, he'd probably say, shut up. <laughs> she got what I was talking about. Everybody got it. There was a standing ovation because they understood uh. I was not going to take this. And it wasn't the right space for that. And you can't act mm -hmm. out. And it brought it right down to a nice note. Everybody respected it right away. They got my sense of humor. And the, work with, and the readings were phenomenal that night. Just phenomenal readings that night. Really great details. And when you get them, you know, people, again, they don't know how to behave, how to act. A lot of them come in fear. A lot of it is, come to me, come to me, come to me. And when I do messages for people, I say, the number one thing you should not do is say, come to me, come to me, come to me. Because when it's about like that, it's a desperation. And it creates a blockage of the energy because when you're thinking of self, it, it kind of blocks the rest of the energy to happen. Mm -hmm. So I always say, please keep it open and, and try to listen to, um, to the words and try to help another person who's going through. Send them light, send them love when they stand up or receive a message. Because really it's for everybody here. And it's, it's because we're all having the human experience. We all share this human experience and we all share de uh, birth, we know a little bit of birth, but we all want to know about death. So learn from the other people that get readings because we're all human, we've had certain experiences. So, yeah. And this is something that I, I muscle tested in the shower um, to see if it was the right time, but I wanted to ask you, I know you've been doing um, soul readings for many, many time, uh, for a long time. Um, I always like to make these very interactive, experiential for the audience and for the audience to get to know me um, also in a very deeper way. If you would be open to doing a short soul reading uh, during the recording. For you? Um, yeah, yeah, I can tell if, you things. If, I if you're up, open I'll to. tell you things I pick up throughout the work, throughout the interview. How's that? Sounds the good. The first thing I want to say I pick up very strongly, as obviously you know that, is that you're a, 
obviously a very good medium, and you're an excellent medium, but I don't think you've pro- approached that yet. I don't think you've delved into that in a serious way. Mm-hmm. And I'd love you to do that. Now, you, of course, you're extremely intuitive. You can do that. You've done that, being the cancer. But you'd also be a very good, excellent medium because I, not only can I see colors from you, beautiful greens when your auric field, which is very much a healer uh, vibration, nurturing vibration. If there's some yellow there when you're around your shoulder, around your head, which is mental energy. So sometimes you still got to remember not to think it out. <laughs> and uh, But th- there's also the purple blue from your... Um, Heart, you just see the green, but it's a purple blue here, which is spiritual. So you love to do spiritual work from your heart, so sincerely from the heart. Um, and that's really nice. But there's a way for it, Emilio, to grow, you know, to grow further. It feels like I, I'm like a little blade of grass, but I know I can grow into a tree kind of feeling, you know. Um, and I think you've done pretty well as far as um, integrate, integration of many, many disciplines. Um, I think that, uh, but you have to make up your mind what you want. You know, I feel like you have to make up your mind what you want, because um, I think you do your gifts of many different types of things. But one thing you have to hold on to one thing and, and go go on. And I do feel you've been around people in many lifetimes, in people whether it's in religious ways, um, almost like I see like in the time of the apostles, you wearing that outfit that I've worn and the sandals. And but I think a, a teacher in many worlds, many languages, if you will, missionary religions all over the world, in this world, this earth. But I also think you're you're connected to different solar systems and galaxies. I mean, this earth is, as you probably find more than I do, because um, I think you're you were younger and you're more of a star seed in a way than I than I would of uh, my work. But I think that you're, you do things in, um, I just get a sense that you're connected in different levels of, what can I say here, life forms, galaxies, and, you know, many people think uh, uh, extra, extraterrestrials, and those, they're just higher beings of consciousness, I'm mostly. And mm. I think you tune into that energy a lot, and I think that your sense of, oh, the, the word missionary comes in, so, so sense of missionary, and your mission here is to really bring not only one sense of consciousness but to glean me from different how can i say this star systems around and the best in them and bring that the best into the humans and i see that you'd like to have it sounds very strange i'm going to say it anyway like a map a map that you could actually do um see a human being i'm not sure it's right now you could you could kind of map up their emotion you could map them or their emotions map out you could sense who they, where they've come from where they're going you're really good at that i know it sounds weird what i'm mm-hmm. saying but it's like you know they have um uh for the uh eegs of these strips of paper coming out of the machine it's almost like that i see with you like you can easily tell about the human condition and i think you've come back here again to help heal many aspects of the human condition not one aspect but many aspects because i think you've been a leader in many places a leader but you've also when i say leader i don't say leader in a way like a political leader you've been with people that have been in charge or or and it's not a political it's a good way it's almost like you've been an ambassador or and you are an ambassador um for many different um sources if i can say it that way or legions i'm just getting this stuff in my head um and that you know it's coming to fruition with the work that you do and i think that your work here is also from your soul level is just to give 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 and serve but to uh, plant seeds in people's minds to open up to the and i'm seeing flowers so letting them flower and blossom to who they are and i think that you have that um i i, I got I, that's what i sense with you there's got to be a sense of just nailing down one thing that I have to really do because there's so much stuff going on and coming through you that it's got to be like I have to do one thing and really stick to it. So when I say mediumship, what I mean by that is not only you, you, consciousness of the the human being that moves on out of the human body, but other higher levels of, of beings from other you know star systems, if you will. That, that's what I feel, mm-hmm. and I rarely get that, but I got it for Shirley MacLaine and getting it for you and a couple of other wow. people. Yeah, I once had a reading with them uh, in Sedona. It was so strange. I brought people to Sedona to do, watch UFOs, and I went to Boynton Canyon. And I didn't, I've never done it, so I didn't know what was going on, but we stood around this canyon, and we're looking at the sky at 10 o'clock at, on a Saturday night, and it didn't see anything. And I'm, my Capricorn rising thought, these people are paying money. we got to do this. we got to see something. And I'm, <laughs> Come on, Pleiadians, where are you at? <laughs> well, exactly. So I closed my eyes, and I, was tell, I told everybody we have to meditate. We have to raise our vibration. And so we did that. And about 10 minutes after, we, I, we all started seeing these lights in the sky uh, over here and over there. And it looks like it almost reminded me of like TV studio.
you, you bring your vibration up to a certain frequency and the people, spirit people, will let, lower them down and you meet halfway. In this case, I was very, very aware that as I brought my energy up, that these beings, and I don't know who they were, these beings brought this, their energy down and it felt as if it was like a, a 777 going into the head of a needle <laughs> pin or a pin. That's mm. how expansive this was. And they had us really, really close it down to limited, limited vibration. So, and I, and I got it. I got the message because I had to keep it very simple. And they said, we do not, we are from the Pleiades. And that's because I run from two. And they said, we are from the Pleiades. And we do not understand one thing. You human beings have the energy of love all around you yet you don't use it. Why is that? And that was all they said. Mm. And they went on. And that, to me, is pretty profound because we don't use the energy there. And that was what they said. But that's, again, I think you're a, like a star man. <laughs> yeah. I think you're going to bring a lot. Of like what they said, I think you're going to validate and help people to become aware of that energy and, and to use it. So mm. I think that's your, you're, you're here in a mission and you're here as a... Um, and I, I really don't feel that you are... Um, take things seriously as far as when people say things to you, or I don't feel you're on that level of hurt that people, oh, that makes you feel bad. I think you rise above that. I think you've had lifetimes where you've been in that, but you've, about, you've learned all that. You're kind of above that now. So like you've come in totally as a teacher and as an ambassador, I gotta say, and that's what I get. <laughs> yeah, and you are the ambassador <laughs> For, for the spirit world and brother. Thank you so thank much for you, that. Thank you. you mentioned the word openness and I'm wondering now, like you do your own ritual to open up when you are receiving sure. messages. Sure. If the other person isn't open, does that affect your openness I'm, or it has nothing well, to do with it? It affects the, the expects experience. So before I go on stage or do a I do a lot of readings on Zoom. This Friday I'm doing a whole evening of spirit. I do a lot of these on, online. And I, and I make sure that everybody has, I want everyone to have a good experience. And I know that the one person is desperate or that person is desperate. And I have to right away really get, really hold on to their expectations and really eliminate their expectations. Now that's, that's a hard thing to do sometimes. But that's where I kind of throw them my sense of humor. Or I throw them from another way of thinking. I get them out of their heads. It's an important thing to do because they might, because everything is energy. And again, if they're pulling the energy, and it blocks the energy. So it's like, you know, a clear screen, but if someone's pulling it, you don't have the clear screen, it, it blocks it. So what I have to do right away is I have to share with them how they should not behave. Number one, many people don't know how to receive a reading. So I gotta educate them as how you as a recipient are to receive. And I, I play with a joke, you know, I have a humor. Say, We're having a three-way tonight. I'm ready, they're ready, but are you ready? And people laugh and say, no, here, and then I go to the seriousness of it, saying, you know, you have to be open to all the experiences. The spirit world will use the energy of the space. And if you're pulling it, they don't have enough energy to use. So in your mind, you know, mediumship is mind-to-mind -mind communication. It's, it's there from, because the soul is the mind, the mind is the soul. So from mm -hmm. their mind, they're sending thoughts, telepathic thoughts, memories, pictures into the mind of the medium. And they're using, if you will, the mind of their loved one, the recipient. And they have to be able to use those three pieces in order for it to manifest. And when one of those are off, it, it kind of blocks it or it comes in cloudy and it, it's really hard. They have to work extra hard, I gotta work extra hard. And it doesn't need to be that way. So I, I, when it's of love, love is the fastest vibration there is, right? So love is it. So if I, I, say, I do a meditation sometimes and I bring in that loving energy. It works really well. Or when they bring in love of, of, from the past of coming in love, it changes the whole energetic field, field, right? So that's really what you have to do. You got to change it and educate people to how to be a recipient. And that's really as important as how to, you know, give a message, how to receive a message. It's really important. Mm, that's very useful. Very useful to prep people up. Um, James, we end every podcast with a segment called the final trio, which are rapid fire questions. You can answer in any way that you want. Okay. Before that, where would you send people to connect with you even further to get to know all your thousands of books that you have out there, your shows, everything, where, yeah, well, where would you send people? I'd put them as, um, don't go on Wikipedia cause that's not written, not written by me as some <laughs> skeptic. So don't go there. I'd go to the school, the JVP school of mystical arts.com. Mm. And that is everything. I mean, that, that's it. And then the other site is my own vanprog.com. That's those two sites. And that, um, gives them a, f and then go amazon.com for books and cards. I have a lot of cards. Um, but, I would say, yeah, vampark.com, put their email on there. They can register email. And there'll be, um, I do a newsletter once a week. And I also let people know when there's going to be a presentation. 
once a month I do readings online. I do events and uh, it's, they're great. They're really great. So I'm going to probably do more of those. So eventprog.com is where they should register their email. Yeah. And are you yeah. working on any new uh, TV shows? Right I now? am. I'm actually working mm -hmm. a couple of different things. I'm working a couple of reality shows, which I, you know, I'd like to talk about it until it's manifested, but a couple of reality shows and I'm working on a book, which I mentioned earlier, my life has gone to the dogs. Um, and I'm working on another book based, another show based on my book, Talking to Heaven. So like a ghost mm -hmm. whisper show. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. Well, I feel that we could keep talking for hours and I'd love to have yeah. you back on okay. at any point sure. uh, when, when those new projects start coming through. Um, sure, Emilio. Sounds great. Thanks for having yeah. me. Been wonderful. Of course, brother. <laughs> yeah. For the final trio, just quick rapid fire yeah. questions. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask you, the first one is, if a medium is the ambassador of the spirit world mm -hmm. and you have the opportunity to be an ambassador and write a final message um, from the spirit world to the physical world, what would that be? Um, love is the answer. Don't look outside yourself. Find it within. Mm. And if you said that earth is a schoolroom, what's the best way for a spirit to get to the top of the class while they're here? Um, don't push the river. Let it flow. Mm. This last question we ask at the end of, end of every show is called the time capsule question. And it requires us to travel a bit out into the future around 15, 20 years down the line. I chose these time frames because at that point, the younger generations are going to be stepping more into leadership positions around the world. And hypothetically, we gather all these leaders in a room and they start seeing all of these time capsules laid out with names on them and you have your own time capsule in that room and these leaders are going through all of them opening the time capsule seeking out tools and guidance to be able to carry out the new earth that we're co-creating you could include anything uh, in this time capsule to leave behind um, whether it's physical it doesn't have to be physical it could be energetic it could be a frequency it could be a quote it could be whatever you 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 can think of quantum possibilities what would you put inside of the time capsule? Wow. Um, wow. I would put a couple of things. I'd put an energy of um, the only energy that is real, which is love. Love is the only energy that's real. And with that love energy, the capsule opens up these little seeds and have the awareness that um, we have to sometimes seed each other, put love into each other. And, and, and also there'd be a, um, maybe a mirror there to recognize that you are love as well. And then another mirror to show it to other people that they are love and that we're here as one. Um, I'd put the, let, the number one in there, that we're all one. And we, we learn from uh, each other in that I often say that there's maybe a snowflake, which represents to me the diversity, that really we're learning about the diversity of every, every snowflake is different. Every human yeah. is different. It's, we're, here not to, we're here to learn the differences and to honor God that design of God in all different ways, all different languages, all different colors and countries and so forth. That's what we're here to learn, the, the wonderness of all the differences. No one owns God. We're all one. And um, that's really the most interesting thing that people could learn, that no one owns God. God isn't be owned. We're, it's all for everyone. And we, we have to be responsible to one another. So, yeah, I'd put that in there. i put the number one. And, uh, yeah, I think that's what I'd put in there. And below your name, there is a reflective question that you can leave for these leaders. What would you what would you give them as a reflection? Are you living the best life possible? I love or, that. or another one under that would be um, when you pass over and you look at your life, is the world a better place than when you found it? Mm. And you said that the number one question that we get asked in the spirit world is what's the amount of love you have in your heart? Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. James. <laughs> thank you, Emilio. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Um, thank you, brother. Getting to know you, learning about you. And wow, I'm, I'm blown <laughs> away by all the all the things that we traversed today. <laughs> I think yeah, we could have kept keep, very keep good. digging. We could have kept <laughs> digging. Um, I'd thank love to you. do this again, as I told you. And yes, love to. Love to. Wishing you the best of thank love you. and luck in everything that you're doing. And, and I'm just you, admired uh, by your work. Thank you so much.